really nicely from the previous one that you've just heard. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, the challenge of uh, collections digitization and how we're trying to insert various AI processes to accelerate that. And in particular, I want to talk a little bit about um, the challenges associated with insect collections. And I think many of you, if you're familiar with insect collections, will know they represent quite a big challenge um, because of various... Uh, let's see if I can use this. There we go. <clears throat> they represent a particularly big challenge because of the nature of those collections. Um, so I really want to focus in on this issue of how we go from physical to digital collections, and in particular, insect collections. They are difficult because most of them are stuck on a pin. So you simply have a pin with a series of labels sort of skewered like a kebab, and those labels then contain most of the information that you want to get at. Um, and that's a really big problem uh, if you want to digitize at scale, not least because insects constitute about 50% of all described life on Earth. They're typically about a third uh, of all of the major collections. Certainly that's true in our case. Um, uh, so there is an awful, lot, an awful lot of them, and they're really important biologically. A lot of the science, actually, that happens on our data often um, insects are um, used and are, are really kind of critical to that. So one of the ways that people have tackled this, and certainly we've tried to tackle this a good few years ago, is rather than digitize individual specimens, we've looked at trying to digitize the drawers, the whole drawers that they sit in. There's a lot less of those drawers. There's two problems with that. They're often working collections. So people are moving those specimens about. Those drawers are not static. And also, critically, you don't get access to all of that information that's on those labels if you actually digitize the drawers. A few institutions have gone down that road. But um, critically for us, we really wanted to try and get access to that label information. So the conventional approach to dealing with this is basically to do it manually. And this is a good example of that workflow, uh, which we've refined and do an enormous amount of at the Natural History Museum in London. Uh, you basically take your specimen, you unskewer the kebab, you take all those labels off, you lay them out, usually with a barcode, you'll then take a photograph of those, your, which looks something like number five down there, and then you'll re-skewer the kebab and stick that back in the box. And we've got pretty good at that. We can do that usually in about uh, three and a half minutes per specimen. Sometimes it's a bit less, sometimes it's a bit more. On average, we'll probably digitize about 250 specimens a day per digitizer. If you're going really well, and your collection is really well um, organized, sometimes you'll get that up to about 400 specimens. But even so, when you've got really huge collections, that's still a massive, massive challenge. So um, uh, we really wanted to look at a new approach for doing this. And when I put this slide together, I called it a new approach. And then I realized, actually, we've been doing this since uh, about five years ago, we developed this approach. It wasn't that new, but we've made a number of innovations to this approach that, since then. So this is a system called ALICE. ALICE stands for Angled Label Image Capture Equipment. And it's basically a device whereby <clears throat> you have a series of SLR cameras, five around the side and one on the top. You put your specimen into that device, you press a button, and you take a series of pictures of those specimens, uh, of the specimen, but from all sorts of different angles. So in effect, what you get is you get that full image of the label, but only by looking at that whole series of images. And then we use a series of computer vision-based approaches to try and stitch those labels together and get one composite version of that label that then we can extract, transform, and get into, get into our databases. So we, did, um, we had a go at this back in 2018. We published a paper. Um, uh, uh, on this at that time. And um, in many ways, it's a, it was a very good system. You can um, get maybe about 800 specimens. Um, in some cases, you might get, I think on rare cases, we've even done 1,500 a day using this approach. But the computer vision system attached to this, that has to be operating in, that's only when 
the circumstances are absolutely ideal. So that you can see this sort of the basic idea of how this works here. Um, it uses something called work well, uses corner detection and image thresholding of labels, very simple based approaches to try and stitch those labels together. And in reality, the way that this has actually been used is that most of the digitizers that we have, they haven't actually been using the computer vision software because it basically fails, but they find that they can manually transcribe very quickly just from seeing that series of different labels, which of course is not really what we intended. So last year, we thought we really ought to try and update the software. Um, and um, started to use a new approach, a, a deep learning approach, to try and extract um, information from the labels. And that uh, approach is set out here. Um, and the basic idea is, again, you load your specimen, you take that series of pictures, you use, in this case, region-based convolutional neural networks, um, CNNs. And, that's then, and what that does is basically it recognizes the pin and the label, you then uh, use a series of um, uh, uh, create a series of quadrilaterals from those uh, masks that you've created. Um, remove the background, transform the perspective of all of those labels, and then again you align those and get one composite image that then you can then feed into a system to um, OCR and extract the text. Now that worked better, a lot better, and under a lot wider range of circumstances and would give us about 70% accuracy. In fact, um, uh, Ariana, the person who's led a, a lot of the work on this, she presented this at Tadwig um, last year. Um, so 70% accuracy isn't bad. That's not 70% of specimens worked. It's 70% of the um, uh, uh, set that um, uh, it had been um, trained on would work. But nevertheless, we really needed to up that. And so um, we've been making a number of refinements this year, which have now got us much closer to a 95% accuracy. Um, and this uses a series of different methods. So again, it, uh, it uses um, RCNN masks, uses something called Facebook's Detectron library to help us do that. <coughs> We find the uh, label edge quadrilaterals, but then the real revelation is not trying to map the whole label together, but actually looking for the individual strings of text and then warping those and stitching those texts back together to create a, a, a version of um, the, the, the label. And that gives us, as I say, much higher accuracy and is, is proving um, to be really successful. Um, there's a few other innovations that we've made. We've never really had a proper software interface for this before. Thank you. Um, and we're using now uh, uh, Spotify's Luigi system, which is a sort of Python-based module, which allows you to batch all these jobs together. So that's really um, uh, helping us. And um, it also uh, um, has Hadoop support. So it's really scalable in terms of where those images sit and the computer processing required to um, uh, do um, uh, all of this work. So it has a nice interface. You can see, you can just about see that one on the left is a, an individual specimen with four images. This is a batch of specimens being processed within Alice. And um, uh, yeah, so we've got a nice piece of software that goes alongside that now to help users make it work. Where are we going next? Well, we mentioned previously in Ben's talk, you heard a bit about how we're looking at robotics to try and think about placing those specimens in the system. So that's one approach. The other approach, and again, a number of talks have sort of touched on this issue, is the role of basically graph databases to help clean and process and further automate um, the extraction of that data. Um, and the particular work that we're doing in that space is being done by um, Hiris, who's sitting down here, and she's going to give a talk um, on Thursday um, about our work um, associated with something we call the planetary knowledge base, which is um, our approach to dealing with automation of all of that text. 
I think I will stop there just on some acknowledgements. So Ariana and Ben have really been the lead uh, on the AI associated with this. And then um, Lawrence Livermore, Ben Price, Steen DuPont and Helen Hardy have been helping with um, a lot of the testing of this. So this is now in production at the NHM and hopefully those models will get further and further refined. So we'll be able to work through a much greater range of specimens very soon. Thank you very much. Are there any questions in the chat, maybe? No. Anyone in the room? I think Deb, maybe. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Um, so any, you mentioned the some of this being more like open source. Can other people use this technology? Is it how expensive is it? So, um, yeah, all the software is on GitHub. Um, and then the aim is to build or actually publish a sort of a how-to guide for the uh, kit itself so that you can actually make the device that Alice sits on. So one of the things in the original version of Alice, we use a set of SLR cameras. The reality is you don't need to use fancy SLRs. You actually can use... Um, uh, other forms of camera, especially given the lighting conditions and the physical conditions inside the device are quite controlled. So we're trialing different cameras, but our aim is to publish the instructions on how to make the kit. So we have been approached actually quite a lot by people wanting to buy Alice. Mm. To be perfectly honest, we're not in the business of selling bits of hardware. But you could um, be. We could be, but I'm not sure that's where our yeah, heart is sure. uh, and our best sets of skills are. Um, I think so what we'd be more inclined to do is publish the instruction manual on how to make that kit yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do we have time for one more question? Okay, cool. That's handy. <laughs> Thank you. I think first time I heard about the this kind of insect label scanning was that week 2014 from Sharon Grant. I wonder if there is like a club of museums who are uh, struggling with the entomological labels. Do you exchange ideas? Do you share technologies? And uh, one little comment on buying equipment. There is a Mambo project with strong British involvement with Tom August. They are also approached for their camera traps. People want to buy this stuff. And if you, if you don't want to run the business, someone else could. I think this will actually intensify digitization worldwide. I don't think manual, like do it yourself, will fix it for countries like Rukai mentioned. Think about this. I think it will it'll be it will be important. Yeah. Um, so with with for example the issues at the Field Museum. So I know they've been working with um, uh, uh, yeah Lightning Bug, and uh, there are kind of multiple approaches to trying to tackle this problem. I think. Where the the level of accuracy now that we've got with Alice, I think this is possibly edging it out in front, um, uh, which is exciting. As for the kind of the the hardware sale bit, um, I honestly don't know about that space. I mean, there is there's some IP issues here, and also the museum won't want to start getting involved in that space too, and it starts to get complicated at that point. But we may have to enter it in the context of the Disco Initiative, because we're quite likely to have to build those bits of kit for other UK institutions. And at that point, maybe then it makes more sense to um, start selling it. But I, I honestly don't know, and I'm a little hesitant, because as you can imagine, we've got lots of other things we need to do too. So I just wanted to raise, you just said any camera, you know, there's varieties of cameras, and immediately I'm thinking cost of doing this for smaller institutions. Yeah. So could you just buy five, I don't know, cell phones and use their camera? So potentially, we've actually been looking at Flix cameras, these uh, which are not super cheap, but are getting a lot cheaper. So these are the sort of industrial cameras. They're often used in robotic situations. Um, they, they're also, they've got some very clever functionality that we actually don't really need to make use of. But that's where we've been thinking at the moment um, in terms of cameras. But in principle, I think, yes, you could, um, uh, you know, really lower the bar. Uh, to 
I mean, I know, you know, the camera on my Google Pixel is a fantastic camera, takes amazing pictures, and arguably is certainly a lot cheaper than, um, you know, many uh, uh, cameras that you would otherwise just sort of buy off the street, certainly some SLRs. And because the conditions with which you take the pictures are all quite controlled, you just don't need really fancy stuff to get fantastic images with this. Thank you. Also, like kind of off of that, I think it's really interesting that a lot of people in the music industry are using iPhones to shoot music videos. So like the cameras are getting really good. Um, but our next speaker is Margot. Um, is Margot online? I think so. Yes. Okay. So we are getting that set up. And once that is done. 